Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 559. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Congo. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you're listening on Friday, the 20th of September, 2019. Welcome to another special edition of Anglican Unscripted, and I'm not going to lie, they're all special. All 559 are just as, about as peachy Anglican as you can get, talking about everything we talk about, from theology to news to politics, and today's going to be no different. But before we get there, you as an audience member have an important responsibility, and that's to spread the Anglican Unscripted gospel. Well, no, just make the pro program more more palatable for other people by spreading it through the algorithms of Facebook and YouTube. So please share us, like us, subscribe to us, and when you get a chance, go to the comment sections and add to the comments because that's where the program continues. We had more than 250 comments in our last episode. Let certainly expect more on this coming episode because we're going to talk about politics, American politics and English politics and Anglican politics. Uh, because well, Christian today laid down the gauntlet and said uh, they're never Trumpers in an editorial written by Mark Golley. And I thought we'd start off with that because uh, Donald Trump was impeached here by the Congress uh, in America this week. And it's uh, been therapy for the liberals. It's allowed them to finally laugh and get things off their chest. Uh, it's been a calling card and a, a war call for the conservatives and it's going to be interesting to watch what happens here in the next uh, two years as we come up to the november 2020 election uh and i gotta say probably the re-election of donald trump because of how uh, this is being handled before we get there we need to talk about christianity today going all gaga george mark golly an acna uh, attendee uh has decided He's a never Trumper and he wants the world to know. Well, Mark Golly, the editor of Christianity Today, penned an editorial calling for Trump to be removed from office, likening uh, him unfavorably to King David and other sort of wonderful biblical allusions. And he, well, Mark Golly drank the Kool Aid, some people would say, and accuses Trump of uh, undefined crimes against the Constitution. He must go because he did something bad, but what that bad thing is, we don't quite really know. Now, I'm not particularly surprised. Mark Gale is a part of that very small sliver of the evangelical elite that have been never Trumpers from day one. Christianity Today, a uh, word here. I used to write for Christianity Today when Gale came on as editor a number of years ago. They didn't need my services anymore. That happens a lot. Uh, so. But Mark Golley, uh, under his editor and under his leadership, the magazine's taken a pro-immigration stance. It's taken a stance in favor of the Equality Act, which is the law that uh, Democrats are pushing that would introduce in the United States the sort of speech and conduct codes that you have in Britain and Canada that criminalized uh, uh, discussion of gay issues or transgender issues that uh, a person can take offense because they feel offended by your speech. So Christianity Today on the social side of the equation has taken a liberal stance in the last few years. And Mark Galley, who, I, who retires as editor on January 2nd, is going to go out with a bang. And he may very well burn down the newspaper before it goes. Well, it's interesting because he's, he'll be doing interviews today on CNN and all the, uh, the pundit uh, uh, cable channels because he just made himself very famous in the eyes of... Uh, liberal media they're like oh, we got a Christian on our side an evangelical and um, they love to promote people like that and uh, Mark Alley has just made himself one of the most famous CNA uh, uh, attendees that I can think of now well, Mike Pence would be more famous Vice President Pence but Pence uh, is obviously going to be more famous and I think the uh, governor of Ohio is also a, an attendee of an act of church now it works differently over in England. You can't really uh, impeach somebody like Boris Johnson. You, you basically have to uh, have quick call elections. How does that work over there? Yes, we, we, we don't have that, um, partly because it was always assumed that the democratic process was healthy enough to deal with 
uh, a corrupt prime minister, he would soon lose confidence. Our confidence in our own de democratic system has been badly shaken by the, the, the Remainer parliament that we had where we simply ground to a halt um, and a lot of people are asking whether or not we should move to proportional representation uh, so that, that never happens again but uh, probably the answer is the crisis we've just been through should never repeat itself um, and therefore you it would be silly to break the system to deal with something um, you know generals are always looking to fight the last war uh, I'm, I, I'm drawn to proportional representation because I, I live in an area where um, where the party that sits here is never going to be overcome. So mm. there's, there's a great deal to be said for proportional representation if you want your vote to count. But I think in terms of uh, democracy, we are, um, uh, we're, we're okay as we are. There's a very funny cartoon in the newspapers today which had, had the Queen in giving the government speech because she the government speaks through her Charles sitting next to her the Queen saying we we're determined not to have any foreign powers who are unelected rule over us and Charles is saying got in hill me him el mummy after us at last <laughs> but but by and large our balance is working at the moment so they're watching we're watching your impeachment process with with interest because of course the the commentators are saying if the Conservatives manage to throw off the re the uh, left-wing challenge in, in England, maybe the same thing can be repeated in America and Trump will get a second term. Yeah. Well, since the, since the impeachment process began, Trump's popularity, according to the most recent polls, has risen by six points. And at this stage, Trump is more popular than President Obama was at this stage in his first term. So I, uh, I, you make a fool of yourself when you do political prognostication, but Donald Trump is in a very good political spot. The Democrats have sort of scored an own goal by seeking to appease their base for an emotional thrill. They've basically lost the country uh, from an electoral point of view. I mean, it's interesting. One of the common things in the thread of American politics is Americans love the underdog. And I'm turning off my, my thermostat here because the furnace keeps going on because it's five degrees outside. It's really cold here in Connecticut, and darn it all if it keeps going on and making noise in my show. But uh, we love the underdog. We love people like Trump uh, for a little while. I mean, he. I'm going to be honest. If you absolutely hate Trump, I understand. I mean, he, he gets on me sometimes, too. If you love Trump and think he's a great president, I understand because he's doing a lot of wonderful conservative-ish things. He's uh, rewriting the federal courts. He's uh, put uh, um, Planned Parenthood in its place. He's brought the uh, abortion uh, issue back to a level playing field. He's uh, brought the economy uh, to a 3.5 percent unemployment rate. There's a reason we don't have uh, things like Occupy Wall Street going on right now. Everybody's got a job. They're all employed. Nobody, there's no protesters in the street because Donald Trump has everybody employed. No matter what your color, race, creed, you have a job. Uh, no president's done that well in 50 years. So if you love Trump, I can understand the reasons you love Trump. And this is why in a day and age where the media is just pundits, I can see why there's such a dividing line. There's nobody in the middle anymore. And uh, it's going to be like this for a long, long time. Because if you get rid of Trump right now, you're dealing with President Pence. And I would love that day as well. So, you know, I think Trump's going to be in the news and part of our show. I don't think he's Anglican. But uh, when Anglicans talk about Trump, he will certainly... Uh, Donald uh, Trump is Anglican. Yes, he is. He is? He's a, he's a parishioner of Bethesda by the Sea Episcopal Church in Palm Beach, Florida. Oh, where he and his cool. wife, uh, Melania, were married. Do they attend? My regularly? old parish where I grew up. <laughs> uh, yes, they do. Oh, okay. They attend their uh, Christmas and uh, Easter and various holidays, and they sometimes go to St. John's at uh, Lafayette Square in Washington. But uh, President Trump uh, was reared as a Presbyterian. His wife was reared a Roman Catholic. He's been divorced. So what happens when divorced uh, divorcees of Presbyterian and Catholic marry? They become Episcopalians. Oh, and their child, Baron Trump, is uh, I think is being confirmed. It was just confirmed. So. They're in the Anglican world, whether people like it or not. Let's move on to uh, some. But uh, no, we haven't we haven't finished the the, uh, 
the Christianity today. Oh, sure. Franklin Graham, Franklin Graham penned a uh, piece that uh, appeared on Facebook, which we've reprinted on uh, Anglican on Inc., where Franklin Graham said uh, he was quite perturbed by Christianity today's entering into the political fray in this way and also using his father as uh, a club to beat Donald Trump because he pointed out my father Billy Graham voted for Donald Trump at the last election is a friends was a friends of Donald Trump and would uh, no more support the Christianity Today editorial than I Franklin Graham do so it's it's this is sort of a Chick-fil-A moment for Christianity Today uh, they may have uh, to capture the moment they may have done They've got, well, they've got a subscriber base of 130,000 people, and I don't think there are that many progressive evangelicals in the United States uh, that would want to pay $36 a year for this sort of stuff. Yeah, well, we'll have to see. It's interesting. I like it when people talk and have reasonable conversations about hard topics. And, you know, I think you, the the Gali piece was a hit piece, and it was just kind of rehashing some Democrat talking points and somebody who really wasn't paying attention to what happened in the impeachment process. But so what? You know, I I, I think he was as kind as he could be uh, for the the anger he has towards Trump, and I I think the Franklin Graham aspect is going to play out differently because I don't know what type of political influence he still has. Franklin Graham's got a very strong political influence between uh, the traditional conservative evangelical uh, fundamentalist uh, Pentecostal demographic in the United States. Well, the Southern Through, Baptists, I mean, aren't as politically organized as they used to be. No, that that's true, but the but the Graham stands against the evangelical establishment the way Donald Trump does against the political, against, well, the way Boris Johnson stands against the London establishment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, I read on Facebook, Franklin Graham is, uh, is being badmouthed by uh, English evangelicals, the Bishop George. of Sheffield, uh, yeah. wants his parishes not to take part in a crusade because of Franklin Graham's uh, political utterances. And they denigrate his Christianity. Well, here's the thing. His Christianity is shared by the majority of American evangelicals. And they're the outliers, if you will, not Franklin Graham. If you just want to do sheer numbers, whether it's right or wrong, that's not the topic. But how much support does Franklin Graham have? A great deal. Okay. Let's transition. You got permission to transition now? We got all the, our, our, I, our Trump yes, talk. Which one of us has the squeaking hamster wheel? It's not me. And it's not showing up on the, the master audio. So oh, Okay. It, it, it's, it's a piece of European uh, extraneous noise. That's right. Uh, I'm glad yeah. it's just me. Great. Yeah. It, well, it's it could, be a fine Brit could be a fine British motor car in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's got their little <laughs> two stroke cylinder car going. <laughs> yeah. I've seen those on the, on, on the causeway. Transition time. Sorry. Yeah, about transition that. time. Um, I opined uh, a week ago that there are no more conservative bishops left in the Church of England. Mm -hmm. And to prove my point, they appointed a new Archbishop of York, a not conservative bishop because they couldn't find one no because they weren't looking but i thought we'd talk about him because he's come up on the news before obviously he fits the liberal mold uh justin welby's gonna love this guy and he's already done controversial things within his diocese that offended conservatives uh can you bring us up to speed on this gavin well i'll try uh, one of the things i've been saying for a while is that when a particularly progressive person is appointed, a number of uh, people watching uh, are very surprised and they wonder if the authorities have made a mistake or did they, did they not know this was a part of the agenda? Um, and I continue to say that this is part of a very well-planned progressive program that's been laid down in principle for 20 years and um, that the authorities are of four or five years ahead of themselves. Welby was chosen to, to spearhead what's going on some time before he became Bishop of Durham. And the problem nearly 
the problem nearly arose that, that uh, he wasn't there long enough because Rowan resigned earlier than he was expected to. Cottrell has been chosen because he appears to be an antidote to Welby's weaknesses. So Welby, in English terms, where we're desperately class conscious, uh, looks to be a, a an effete, well-educated uh, Etonian from the top drawer of society. He's actually not particularly well-educated. But Stephen Cottrell is a kind of uh, Essex boy. That That's um, uh, sort of... He comes with a degree of street credibility, not very well educated, um, doesn't sound particularly bright, pragmatic, down to earth, your kind of average man in the street. The, the problem really is, though, that he isn't terribly bright. And what I mean by that is not to be intellectually snobbery, snobbish. It, it, there's no sense that he, um, oh, how, how can you put it um, politely? Uh, he's not very self aware. And um, he doesn't show a great awareness of nuance or possibility or or potential complexity. Um, and indeed, he said in one of his one of his statements that, that not having had a very good education, he's glad when the other bishops don't look down on him or give him extra time to catch up or whatever it is. Um, but he's been saying for some time now that he's very anti conventional Christian morality about sexuality. And he said something dreadful. He said, do you realize that people look at us and they think that we're sexually immoral because of the traditional views we have? We are seen to be immoral by, by secular people. And the implication is that we have to change our morality to what secular people want. And that's exactly what he intends. So how, how and if that wasn't bad enough, there have been clergy in his diocese who've as school governors have found themselves in conflict with um, the mermaids who are the transgender lobbying group who are immensely well funded and have achieved unbelievable leverage in our society and when the the, the clergy have said uh, they appear to have taken over our church school and and i've i've disagreed with them and i've come off worse bishop please help so far from helping he's given the message in private at least if you don't like it you can get out now, he said that to so many people that, that, that a couple of clergy have got out. Um, and when he's been challenged with this, he's simply denied it. Um, well, someone's not telling the truth. So all the liberals are saying our bishop would never not tell the truth. It must be those awful, uh, fundamentalist, horrible, lying, fascist conservatives. And, and the conservatives are saying, actually, he said it to us. And for exactly that reason, some of us have resigned. It would be hard to explain why they've resigned or retired or gone if that hadn't been the attitude they'd encountered. So um, he's been given the second highest office in the country and he appears to have a mandate to move Anglican sexual ethics fast in the direction of progressive secular values. Um, they know it, they've appointed him to do it, that's going to be his job. He's, he's also, in Chelmsford, has appointed uh, a staff and a coterie and uh, archdeacons and diocesan director of ordination. Think the people who actually do the actual work of enforcing the worldview of the bishop, who are on what I would call the church's left. Um, several years ago, I had a story. The dean of Montreal, the Anglican dean of Montreal, was a gay man, one of the first men married in the Anglican Church of Canada. He went and took a parish in the Diocese of Chelmsford. And I contacted the uh, Diocese of Chelmsford for a comment because this was where, you know, this was when the civil partnership thing, well, you know, you're chaste, you're not uh, supposed to be uh, doing anything in the bedroom. And they were the only clergy we have are chaste clergy who have given their assurances to the bishop. And I forwarded to the diocese these articles where this gay dean and his partner talk about the fact that they are far from this <laughs> how and, good it can be and yes. that they're married they're not even in a civil <laughs> partnership and the came, response came back was well they're in a canadian marriage and because gay marriage is not yet here in england we don't we're not going to look into this and and it's essentially the the don't ask don't tell but do what you want to do mindset was there from a very long time, as well as the director of education undercutting Christian traditionalist views on Christian education. And it's just the whole package that Cottrell brought to the Diocese of Chelmsford. It may have already been there, 
But under his leadership, the package of administrators and leaders has been difficult such that uh, we've had uh, a number of clergy, prominent clergy, uh, resign and move out uh, of that area. And Andrea Minichilla Williams, the president of Christian Concern, the Christian Legal Institute, penned uh, an op-ed enumerating all these problems that Cottrell had. And in an unusual step, the Church of England media office the next day put out a statement categorically denying the veracity of Andrea Williams' uh, claims. And in reading in social media, a number of people have posted saying, well, I heard him say this. Uh, who are we to believe? I mean, who do we believe? The Church of England media office or my own stinking ears and eyes? Uh, so the, the National Church of England press office is engaged in the big lie. If we just say it's not true and refuse to address it, then uh, we won't have a repeat of the Philip North problem where you have a bishop who was equally controversial yet from a different direction but in that case, the National Church offices egged on uh, the women uh, advocates to attack Philip North, while here the conservative evangelicals are being savaged by the same people uh, who want to protect Cottrell. Fair yeah, is fair. Yeah, no, it's fair is fair. I mean, it's the reality of what's going on in England uh, is at least 10 years ahead of America as far as its progression right now. Uh, you literally have thought crime that they're prosecuting uh, on the shores of England, uh, Britain, I should say. I don't want to get mm -hmm. that confused again. And uh, <laughs> just want to be sure people know that, you know, they're in Britain is different than us because you do have an educational caste system still where people go to the right schools and the wrong schools they are judged for their, almost their entire lives. And that's still happening, Gavin? Did Gavin freeze up? Uh-oh. Yes, <laughs> we'll yeah, I, had, I, had a, I had a Wi-Fi in, in, incident. I'm back. Okay. Oh, you're back. You were all pixelated. You looked like you're having, you know, somebody beat you up on the side. You got purple. Yeah, and yeah, like, I, oh I thought my it was gosh. my face until I saw the, the, the bookshelves were suffering from the same <laughs> thing. So it was a, a Wi-Fi. So I've changed <laughs> Wi-Fi to, to a better less pixelating thing. So go on, Kevin. We, we, oh, you I was saying that the yeah, nationalists and yeah, I want to be sure the people, our American audience understands that uh, in Britain, you still have an educational caste system. You are judged by where you went to school. Uh, we kind of have that here uh, with the Ivy schools, but um, it, it exists to a, a greater extent from what I understand in Britain. Well, it's changed. In fact, I mean, it is used to, but we're actually now it's been inverted. So uh -huh. um, the, the, there's a much more kudos sometimes in having been educated in a in a state school. Uh, people who've been to the higher, the more expensive, the more successful so-called public but private schools um, are, are, carry a heavier burden. So, I mean, I think it's one of the reasons why Cottrell has been appointed because he's uh, He's a kind of good, ordinary, honest, straightforward man. And what the Church of England's trying to do is to identify with ordinary society and allow ordinary society to identify with, with it. I mean, we're, we're back to you either convert society or you're converted. And the, 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 the Church of England is practicing a kind of form of national spirituality with an occasional Christian twist to it um, that it doesn't Gavin, want to have to... Go on, George. Gavin, uh... Cottrell, uh, I've met Cottrell once or twice. He's very pleasant. He's amiable, yeah. uh, polite. He's uh, Jack Spong is an unpleasant, nasty old man. Has always been a nasty old man. So it's not like it's not uh, not that sort of personality. But I, I just get the sense that he's a pleasant man who's going along with the company, uh, and it's and it really doesn't matter uh, that it was he and not any other of a dozen bishops because the the tracks have already been laid and the train is going to go in a direction. And it doesn't matter who the engineer is. It may go faster or go slower, but the direction has been set by the whole system. Uh, and one man isn't right. really good. It's one man, you know, may or may not, he may speed it up, he may slow it down, but, you know, what did... Um, 
it's just a bit odd that somebody who's been in the public I mean, you're, you're, you're completely right George I agree with that that's how it's working but it is still slightly odd that somebody who's been in the public sphere for um, for, for, for causing controversy with his faithful clergy uh, would then not have that not have it not have it understood as some kind of limiting factor I mean, if he's going to do it in Chelsea will he not do it throughout the whole of the Archdiocese of York you might think and and the answer can only be that they're very happy for someone to to shrug off the uh, the, the, the traditional evangelical constituency and rough them up a little bit which is what he's done well, and, and even when Andrea Minchella Williams tells the truth and publishes it um, the institution says you know we can shrug this off we've got we've got these people beat um, there was a, um, a, a reporter who was asking me for an interview earlier on this morning and she said um, do you see any significance in the fact that the two clergy in the in the national news um, I, I've been given a column in the mail on Sunday which has a, a circulation of my, a million and a half in which I the, the editor has asked me to to, to be more specific about the limitations of the Church of England as I see it. So it's not quite what I would have written, but nonetheless, I'm because Stephen and Cottrell and I are both in the national news. And the the um, reporter was saying, do you see anything significant in the fact that you two stand for exactly opposite things? And, and here's someone leading the Church of England at the very top, and here's someone uh, leaving the Church of England. <laughs> and I said, yes, I think actually in God's sense of humor and sense of timing, the fact that he and I stand for such completely different Christian values and we happen to be uh, in the news in the same week I, I think that is a signal of some kind we do we stand for entirely different ways of being Christian uh, my concern my, my 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 obviously I would say this wouldn't I but but with with Welby and Cottrell at the head of the Church of England um, the accommodation with secular values particularly to with sexuality is set in concrete and will only get worse Let's talk crazy stuff now. Here in America, we have the ACLU, and uh, they're a liberal organization who try to fight for legal rights for the uh, the minorities or people they think are uh, uh, undertow in, in the system. And they have decided by edict that they want to fight for all male bathrooms to have feminine hygiene products because you never know when you'll need one. I think that's how it went. No, um, because men may need them too, or men who don't know they're men. It's so crazy that I can't explain how it really works, but they think that uh, um, men's rooms across America need to have feminine hygiene products. And this kind of relates to a story going on in uh, Britain right now where JK Rowling is under attack for support, supporting Maya, uh, how, how do you pronounce her last name? Maya Forstadter, who tweeted something and got herself fired when she tried to take on the transgender lobby. And George, are you going to freak out or are you going to take a picture the first time you walk into a men's room and see feminine napkins? Gavin, uh, Kevin, excuse me. <laughs> That's right, Gavin's Gavin all the time. Kevin, <laughs> I, I can assure you that in my lifetime, uh, it's not going to happen down here. Uh, <laughs> Florida. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's a silliness. It's a silliness. Uh, J.K. Rowling, uh, who my children enjoyed her books tremendously. They are what they are, nice bit of fluff. She has a very liberal, progressive worldview on most things. And it's neither here nor there to me uh, the, what J.K. Rowling thinks. I mean... It is what it is. Uh, she tweeted in support of a woman academic who basically upheld the primacy of science, that there are two genders, male and female, uh, chromosomes and all that stuff. And Rowling has been savaged by the sort of soppy left who loved her pronouncements on Boris Johnson and Brexit and things of that nature. The same people who celebrated her political wisdom, not talking about her literature, her political wisdom and insight into the culture have now dumped her, just as Nat Martina Navratilovna was dumped uh, by uh, British sporting groups because uh, she supported the concept that there is a difference between men and women that is innate. And it's biological. It is not a choice. 
Now, the ACLU can file all the lawsuits they want, but until there's something in the Constitution that compels uh, the state to uh, regulate what is in private bathrooms, I don't think this is an issue. Well, Gavin, it's, it's, when... it's not legally. It's and you know perhaps you can compel the government, <clears throat> but you can't compel private citizens to do uh, do that sort of thing. It's silly. G Gavin, when did um, and he created the man and woman become a hate crime, a thought crime? Well, I I don't agree with George. I think it's much more significant. And I was thinking earlier on today as we what how we can understand it theologically. Uh, and we could call it the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, left versus right. Um, but I, I, I felt that what really described it best was the absolute versus relative, relativism. So there is a there is an, an absolutism in believing in God. God is the absolute by which from which everything derives. And those who believe in Scripture and Revelation believe that what we have in the Bible is a reflection of his of his categories he's given us, and they 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 matter because. Um, although not everything is absolute, we we live in a structure of, of of reason that holds together in God's in God's character, and the people who don't like God particularly don't like absolutism. They don't like hard and fast rules. They don't like structures and categories, and so what we're experiencing is a is a fight between absolutism and and relativism or relativity, not in the Einsteinian sense. Um, and on top of that, I remember during when Iraq and Iran were fighting each other, feeling a certain sense of relief and thinking, well, as long as these two Muslim nations are attacking each other, they, they won't worry about the West so much. And when they stopped attacking each other, I thought, well, they'll, they'll, one of them is going to come at us now. I felt the same thing a bit about the progressive agenda, uh, because the one of the the groups that have been challenging the trans gender people are, are the, the feminists. There's a very eminent uh, woman feminist lesbian professor at my old university I worked at in Sussex called Kathleen Stock. Uh, and she's actually one of the people that um, Rowling have been supporting. And she's gone out on, an, on, on a limb very bravely to try and halt the closing down of, of, of free speech and thought and the imposition of, of uber relativism that the transgender debate brings. Um, why does this matter? Well, there are, in England, at any rate, there are mothers saying our, our daughters won't eat or drink on their way to school because they want to avoid using the bathroom. Uh, they don't want to have to go to the bathroom and they want to get, take sick leave when their monthly periods come because they don't want to have to deal with periods, with with uh, some form of, of masculine presence masquerading as a woman in the toilets. So for as long as um, the woke administrators continue to do this, it, it does affect the health of ordinary people. And the question is, to what extent, the JK Rowling thing is very interesting, because if you look at her Twitter feed, as I've done, to what extent has Rowling thrown herself in front of this relativistic steamroller? And is she big enough to stop it? Or is the general madness and the the, the 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 love of the relative the kind of anarchy that's come upon us is it so strong that not even somebody as popular and distinctive as Rowling can do it and I think that's what we're waiting to fear to hear and if Rowling and others can't stop it um, then although it's only bathrooms at the moment um, the whole mindset which is which is seriously antagonistic to everything we stand for will gather strength and we we will we will suffer for it at some point. Uh, Gavin, I'm going to uh, sing a nationalist song right now. It's the English are conformists much so more than Americans are. Uh, because people in authority tell you to do this, people will do that. Uh, in other words, I I'll give you an example. The United State of Virginia is passing gun control laws. Well, several dozen county sheriffs have said, well, we're not going to enforce those laws. 90%. And if you say that sheriffs. only yeah. de sheriff's deputies will be allowed to carry firearms, we will deputize every single person who has a firearm. <laughs> so, in other words, I, I hear what you're saying. Now, let's say there is a federal edict come down to say our public schools in, in my rural county would now have to have single gender bathrooms. First off, it wouldn't it take several years to get implemented. They'd never get around to it until somebody fought a lawsuit. Then they then they'd cut the funds in vain. Basically, they'd get rid of bathrooms or everybody would go to private schools. It's, there's a, 
and I think perhaps it's a cultural, but I'm not particularly worried in the long run. Well, because of course God is in charge and something like Stephen Cottrell is not going to change uh, the faith and the working out of God's plans for this world, nor are the transgender activists. They're just evil exists. We have to work around it, but God is still in charge and nobody can make you do something that is evil unless you choose to do evil. Well, I think it's wonderful that I've, sorry, Kevin. Well, one of the bigger contexts here is being able to participate in commerce. People over in England are losing their jobs. In, in Britain are losing their jobs because they take an opinion that science uh, has structure over feelings. And in doing so, these people are no longer allowed to be nurses, doctors, work in uh, the court system, work in, as accountants. And so you're not allowed to participate in common commerce because of your thought crime. And I think that's a bigger context that's going to has the potential of happening here in America. And it was a limited uh, degree of that when we started uh, having lawsuits over gay cakes. Well, my point is that when the state is involved, yes, there can be a level of coercion. Doctors, nurses, lawyers hold licenses issued by the state. But when they're market free from government interference, you can deal with whoever you wish to deal with. If uh, uh, I don't. I would be very surprised to see that that uh, scenario unfold in the United States simply because the people would not put up with it. They wouldn't stand for it, and on the local level, it would not. It may happen in Manhattan. It may happen in Washington D.C. But in Okeechobee, Florida, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, Don, to your point, there was this guy who uh, you remember the early Chick Fil A controversy where. Uh, they came out in uh, support of heterosexual marriage and the uh, the gay lobby on Twitter and around the world just attacked them ferociously. And we had two and three hour lines to get lunch for a week at Chick-fil-A. Well, some activist went up and uh, was on video insulting one of the uh, drive through clerks. And to this day, this guy, because of the backlash of how mean he was to this uh, drive through clerk cannot get a job. And he he opened a piece that, you know, I made the biggest mistake of my life. But he, may, 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 I jump, may I jump on this Chick-fil-A sure, thing, Kevin? Ahead. It's something yeah. we've been talking about, and, and I think people need to get... We need to distinguish between the Chick-fil-A Foundation, which is the Atlanta Foundation where the owners, the family, the uh, uh, Kathy family, who own Chick-fil-A, have invested their uh, excess profits for charitable good. Correct. Chick-fil-A's are franchises, and each franchise is owned by an individual, and our local Chick-fil-A franchise here supports religious entities all the time. So when we say Chick-fil-A is no longer serve, supporting the Salvation of the Army, Salvation Army, or religious charities of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, we're talking about the national entity in Atlanta. We're not talking about your local franchise, which is an independent franchise that has nothing to do with the work of the Atlanta corporate arm. No, I agree with you because here in Plainville, up in Connecticut, they only hire Christians in the uh, uh, Chick-fil-A and you go in there, they all say, God bless you. How was your day? Uh, uh, at the end, uh, the lady said, is there anything I could pray with you for? This is Connecticut. This is the, hard so this is the hardest soil God ever envisioned for spreading the gospel. And yeah, right, Chick Fil A's well, are franchise owned, so I'm so it, um, glad that our, our listeners don't mind the fact that um, we span uh, different nationalities between us. <laughs> <laughs> let alone different denominations. But let's not go there, um, yeah. because we, we, Gavin different... is the foreigner on the show. Yeah, you're a foreigner. Yeah, well, it, but it, it's it's it really. I'm I'm just. The English people will be absolutely gobsmacked to hear what Kevin has just said. They'll be pleased to hear what you've both said. Um, but I don't think I'm being unnecessarily apocalyptic when I say, first of all, one could never imagine uh, an, an, an English franchise filled with Christians who said, God bless you. I mean, what a wonderful thought. Um, Look at the Church of England. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Church of England for quite a lot. You beat me to it, George. <laughs> it doesn't apply to the Church of England of all places. Um, but I, I, I hate to be apocalyptic, but I, I, I mean, I've just written an article in this um, in, in you know, the Mail on Sunday saying, the, what I'm afraid of is an iron curtain coming back, an iron curtain between 
the culturally Marxist West, which is Europe, and the Christian, cult, Christian culturally East, um, because, as Kevin Wright rightly said, this particular episode that led Rowling to join in was a woman losing her job and being sacked for simply saying she she didn't even miss. Uh, I don't think she 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 missed prefix. She simply said sex is real. We've got to the point in England where by saying sex is real, this is now seen as an affront to the dignity of a human being. This is, I mean, this is the most extraordinary place to get into. It, you know, if, if ever Christians were being attacked for being uh, faithless to science, suddenly woke culture denies and revokes science completely and, and very few people seem to mind. So there is a real struggle, not between Iran and Iraq, but between woke culture and on one hand and, and any of the absolutists. And it just so happens that the that, that second wave feminists turned out to be pretty absolutist in, in their values, in which case, you know, we've always said they were part of the um, whole uh, Reformation and Renaissance Christian cousins in, 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 in their, their values. So it'll be very interesting to see. And we, I think we're poised delicately in a power struggle between the rel relativist and the absolutes at the moment being fought out between transgenderism, second wave feminism, where their unusual allies are Christians. See, and Gavin, I I'm an optimist. I don't. I, I. I. All the things that you say are true, but I uh, am encouraged by the 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 American equivalent of the man from Essex, the man in the white van, who have a degree of uh, integrity and moral wisdom that our elites seem no longer to have. And at the see, end, I want to say, George, that, that this is quite clearly the, one of the benefits of somebody who believes in salvation by faith, as opposed to somebody who apparently believes in salvation by works. So I'm told. So I think this this kind of muscular attitude you develop to faith is one of the things that allows you to be so optimistic. I hope you're right. I, I mean, I do, but I do think it's got more to, more to do with American culture than it has to do uh, with faith. But we'll see. Well, so, uh, Americans right. have a, a different DNA makeup of them. We're frontiersmen. Uh, our ancestors, uh, penniless, hopped on a boat and went to a, uh, a new country where they had no hope of jobs, uh, just that, that hope in their system that somehow that they would have it better uh, over here in colonial America. And Not uh, my ancestors, Kevin. We left oh, because of the Church of England. <laughs> you left the Church of England. <laughs> we left and got here in 1620 and... and uh, <laughs> in, in general now and i can't say anything either because i'm a descendant of norwegians and we came here for different reasons <laughs> but well, i'd just like it, to say it, that one of my ancestors was was a, a ship captain with sir walter raleigh and, and got knighted so i i have a pirate in in, in the, in the <laughs> end zone. that's that's one of the things that leads to me to be a non-conformist i i have a, a a methodist friend who for a long while said, you don't understand non-conformist and i said actually if I become a Catholic, I should become a nonconformist. And he was astonished. He thought only nonconformists could be nonconformists. But I did explain to him there's anyone who doesn't accept the the uh, imposition of the Church of England. So in that sense, we're all in the same boat. So Anglican kind of script is made up of Vikings, Puritans, and pirates. Just want you guys to know what, where you're getting your advice from in, in your political pundits and news pundits. Is there anything else we want to cover? We've hit the whole 45 minutes. Uh, I think we got everything, right? Well, uh, I think we should touch upon the uh, controversy that followed because some people have asked, are we going to continue in our current format? Uh, no, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> no I, I think it's a fair <laughs> issue. Sure. It, it, it's a fair <laughs> issue. Um, and as producer, editor, and guy who clicks the record button, uh, Anglican Unscripted is about the topic of Anglicanism. It do does not have to be uh, completely punted by Anglicans. And I have no trouble adding other people from lesser faiths or greater <laughs> faiths, however that may be, uh, onto the program less, less to talk about <laughs> something we're, we're, uh, we're all experts in. We, uh, the people that I get in the program are experts in talking about the historical concept and uh, context of Anglicanism. That's what makes well, it well, scripted. It, it, Kevin and I have uh, been talking about with this with Gavin for several weeks, and we've been, uh, been under a bit of a restraint because it's like saying to a friend, you're, you're going to marry a really ugly woman. I mean, you just can't say that. 
Uh, it's, it's, you know, you think, my God, what does he see what in he her? See? But, don't bring, just don't bring her to tea. <laughs> she's got, it must be the money. So, she's got you know, money. And, and That's after, what you got to think. A certain, after, at a certain point, you just, you know, it, it's as if Gavin came out and became gay. It's not going to threaten me. He's <laughs> gay. Well, you can't sit in my lap anymore, Gavin, but it's okay so, that you're you gay. Re you know? Repeat the as if, George. Just repeat the as if. Not everyone got it. <laughs> but so, in other words, what changing the uh, deck chairs on the ship really doesn't change the. Uh, worth and veracity and the strength of the intellectual and moral integrity that is presented mm -hmm. i don't have any gavin does so let's uh, and that doesn't change so because well, he's joined a different union i think people have to understand over time as in the past we've done this for 559 episodes uh anglican unscripted evolves and it always becomes better and better over time not because of me but because god needs this show to work uh, he, he relies very little on Kevin to do more than press the record button and to edit it. But I have wonderful people on to talk about their faith, to talk about the faith of a nation and a church, and to help you understand uh, in a very transformative way of what's happening uh, before your eyes. Because a lot of people, uh, the mo one of the most common comments are, I watch the program because I don't have time to read the news. That's what we're here for. If you don't have time to read the news and you want uh, people to tell you what's happening, that's what Gavin and George and Kevin and other people we have on the program do for you. And we appreciate I, that. I'd just like to add one. Thank you. Sure, Kevin. I'd like to add one, one yeah. more thing because I thought it was quite wise. It was actually a, a commentator in international Anglican affairs whom I thought would cut me dead. I won't say who it is for the moment. Um, but he wrote to me and he said, um, you, you're not the only one. This is very difficult. But the, the thing that's really struck me recently is all the boundaries are changing. And I thought that was a very wise comment because I think this is about um, the, the boundaries are changing. We're in a very fluid situation where where lots of ideas, political, theological, spiritual movements are shifting. And one of the things I think we're trying to do on uh, Unscripted Anglicana is to uh, is is to map them and keep on top of them, and that doesn't necessarily require uh, um, being members of of one particular group or another. It, it, it's more about perception and discernment. And I think one of the things that I've been most grateful that you two have brought is a level of perception and discernment of stuff I just don't see and learn from. And I th hope that the three of us together will continue to offer that as a gift to the church. But I'll speak for myself, but I'm fairly confident Kevin agrees with me on this point. The boundaries of uh, denomination or church or ecclesiastical organization are artificial boundaries compared to the boundaries of faith in Jesus Christ. Mm. So I, I'm not, I don't get particularly exercised. Uh, I'm an Episcopal priest. My one child worships in an Acna congregation. The other, I think, goes hiking on Sundays. Uh, but the, the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, God is still God. And all of our efforts to basically f make him sign up to our way of doing things are rather futile, I think. No, our job is to draw people to God. And uh, I, I agree with you, George. And I think one of the most important things is to know that uh, what's happening within uh, our lives is no different than what I called for when Pope Francis became Pope, I said, it's time for an open table. And if Gavin's moving on to Rome helps with that, wow, you know, it, it, it's time. Uh, Pope Francis, if you watch, I'm assuming you do. Well, let's just assume Pope Francis watches and kind of skipped it. It's time for an open table. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you've been listening to episode 558 of Nine. Unscripted. Nine? Nine. Really? Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Bother. Something's never changed. Five, five, nine of Anglican Unscripted. And uh, uh, if you're watching, Frank, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>